where it's Taz saying that there are producers out there in the industry, even at the level of internet money, you know, producers who themselves have record deals and they're still not getting paid their beat advances. What's going down is a music entrepreneur club. Bad news. Aaron is back to jumping flights and, and, hopping across islands so it's just dame and i today dry dame and painful pain as we're known in the comment section <laughs> just randomly i came across a link this morning i guess spotify is allowing people artists producers songwriters to uh book studio time for free if you live in la uh nashville in new york i believe but really? you better do it quickly because I'm I'm sure these slots are filling up very fast. And let me get the link for you. I think it's notable. I think it was like notable. Hold on. This is this is promotion for something that notable is like an emerging studio booking app or something. Just Google it. Do a little work yourself. You can't have everything spoon fed. So <laughs> just know that it's real. It's happening. That was a good um, save. <laughs> It's happening. Um, I was on the like I, I tried this. Not that I was not that I need to book studio time. I just wanted to see. You never it, know. It was indeed free, and it was. But I noticed that a lot of the dates were already filled this morning. Um, I probably should have just looked on my phone because I was on my phone. But anyway, we can keep going, Pain. Um, yeah, I imagine a service like that gets flooded pretty quickly. Oh, I got contacted by a free, uh, it's not like totally free, but there's a free tier. It's a playlist submission portal that gives you free submissions every month. I don't know more on that. I'm going to, I'm going to test it out because they contacted me. So speaking of free stuff related to Spotify, um, I, I'll, I'll give the name out when I, when I figure it all out. But anyway, Dame, did you see the so video? Wait, so it's notable.spotify.com forward slash studios. That's where okay. you know, shit. By the time people hear this, it's probably gonna be filled up. So you gotta you gotta be quick. You well, maybe quick. maybe there'll be a second wave of free studio sessions. I don't know how heavily they're they're gonna run this promo campaign. Yeah. So hopefully you get a slot if you need a studio. You know, hopefully at hopefully at this point, people are just know how to record on their own in a quality way i think you know most artists do but it's always good to kind of go to a studio network um i did a networking session for zoo labs last night um a follow-up to the course that i did for them is a free course on networking if you go to zoo labs uh, go to their instagram page and the link will be in their bio but um you know i know that we build a lot you know in uh, online and in these chat rooms or things like that but you know being in person goes a long way still um so you know get out of your comfort zone and, and meet people face to face because that's still to me the best way to really connect and like leave an impression and make sure people don't forget you so don't be afraid to get out the house develop your social skills don't be a weirdo i feel like that that last part was for me because uh, I'm weird and I, I don't like leaving the house. <laughs> it's, no, the theme, I, it's the theme for 2023. Don't be a weirdo. It's been the theme for me. That's been the theme for a while. Because um, I, I feel like the increase of weirdos is is intensifying. And maybe weirdo is not the best word, but certainly people who aren't socially adept. But then I also feel like they're in the majority. It, well, you know, but Well, here's the thing. I mean, I'm going to keep using weirdos because it's just an easy term. It's it's, It's just my term. But where I think it comes from, a lot of it is because we have less face to face interaction, you know, and it's more just online and and I could be in my office reading things, taking in all this information. People can be saying things. And instead of like I could I, I basically can be in here coming up with every reason in the world somebody said something as opposed to getting it validated right you could say something online and i could take it in the in in the worst way possible there's nobody here to tell me like hey damn you didn't mean it like that or that wasn't the context like i could just make things up in my mind i can confirm some biases and then i could just think you know some of the i could i could i could receive information in a way that really wasn't intended 
you know, and then you could just, and that just starts to build, 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 build. And I think that's what produces a lot of, you know, weird interactions, both online and in person, um, because we're not really receiving communication the way it was intended a lot of times. Well, I think there's so. that, but then there's also this new trend towards absolute lack of accountability. And maybe it's one of those things where it's always been there, but I only recently started focusing on that within myself and taking accountability for stuff. Like when I mess up, I really just pause my whole day and try to, you know, even, even online, there was someone that um, I reacted to poorly on YouTube and I apologized to them. I mean, I feel like they came at me in a way that wasn't polite and they agreed and they actually apologized after I apologized, but that's kind of new to me. So maybe people have just always uh, avoided accountability with, with an unparalleled passion, but now I'm seeing it everywhere. The second that I, I guess it's kind of akin to say, you know, you decide one day that you're going to get sober and you realize that all of your friends are alcoholics, you know, something like that. You're like, Holy shit. I didn't even realize this because I was in that same boat with them. And I think it's really interesting the way that people just want to be contrarians. And I think, all right, that's, that's internet troll culture, right? You want to be contrarian just to be edgy and, you know, has to be, there has to be, there has to be somebody that has to say something, even especially when a post is getting love, right? Like if a lot of people are agreeing, there's a lot of people that are agreeing with a post on our page. There has to be somebody that comes in. Well, actually like, shut up. Like that's, there always has to be somebody that comes in with, with the exact opposite view. And I think it is more so for what you're talking about, just kind of (laughs) a little bit of clout and, Sometimes just to be an a-hole. Well, right. And there's that. Now, what surprised me was producer Grant recently interviewed Taz Taylor. And I, I admit I haven't seen the whole interview, but there is one particular clip that producer Grant shared where it's Taz saying that there are producers out there in the industry, even at the level of internet money, you know, multi-platinum, you know, producers who themselves have record deals and they're still not getting paid their beat advances. And, and I've talked about this too. And I know Dame, you said that, that you haven't dealt with that with the label. Now the missing piece that Taz offered is something that I didn't even think about. So when I got my first placement ever, this was, you know, back when they were still mailing stuff nowadays, I don't, I don't get a fully executed copy mailed to me from the label when, when we sign a contract. But back then I got my, um, my fully executed copy mailed back to me as a packet and it had, um, young Jeezy's signature on it. I was like, Oh, that's kind of interesting that he's actually physically signing multiple copies. And now I have a copy of that. What Taz was saying in his video was that these advances aren't getting paid because the lawyers representing the artists who need to sign off on the producer agreements aren't getting a hold of the artists and not prioritizing having the artists sign these, these um, agreements. And that's why producers aren't getting paid, which would make sense why this is something that producers complain about a lot, but other people who do business with labels don't complain about. Now, my question is why do you need, a, 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 a recording artist to sign off on a beat agreement because it's because uh, it's technically his money right i mean it's coming out of his budget the individual artist is purchasing the masters to my beat so so i don't understand why the the um, label can't just sign off on that i'm sure they can honestly i think it's discretionary i think if they don't want to pay this is just one more excuse yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I think we need a le- a lawyer here to say definitively. But I would think that you know the the label is just trying to protect the label at the end of the day. And you know, I think you need all of the agreements fully executed before the funds get transferred. Um, so it, it it seems like it makes sense. I've never been in this this particular situation um, because. Yeah, I never worked with a label and a producer in this capacity. So, um, 
Yeah, I, it seems like the only thing to kind of possibly protect against this is if you have just better relationships with artists. And I know sometimes, you know, well, most times beats are just getting passed around, sent around, things like that. But it just, I think if you had, like, you know, if we were working together, Payne, and a major label was involved, you could just hit me and I'd be like, okay, we'll sign off on it. And I'll chase the artist down. No problem. You know, we'll get it done. Um, you know, and I know that's that still doesn't make it fair to the producers that you have to do that. Um, you know, but you know, I'm sure every case is different of why it's not getting signed. Um, but it just sucks. At the end of the day, it just sucks for the producers that are waiting on their on their funds. Well, it sucks, but what also sucks is the fact that you know, I, I guess I'm naive. Because I figure it's Taz Taylor. You know what I mean? People are going to listen. He he did. He created something that other producers haven't. If, if you don't love the guy, at least you can respect what he did. Well, just like, like our page, there are the comments that deny this entire experience. You know, one of, one of the comments was, which I think is hilarious. Can't get mad because you ain't handling business, right? Make sure that paperwork is in order before you do anything. What does that even mean when yeah. he's literally saying the paperwork isn't being signed off on and the music is still being released by the label? How is it the person, how is it the producer's fault that the paperwork isn't in order? The paperwork is in order, but that's one of those myths that and then producers say stupid ass shit. Here's another, I mean, that was, that was, that, I, I put that in the stupid ass shit category, but then they come up with these off the wall ideas. Like um, here's a comment. I'm not going to say their name, but this is a dumbass comment charge interest have you ever heard of that name no but i and i also don't think we should be reading off the did anybody have a comment that was like oh yes did, did, did anybody was like oh did, like this is interesting maybe we didn't think about it like this no so let me let me say this so the, so the producers <laughs> listen the producers leaving the stupid comments i i think this is just descriptive when it comes to the issue of people talking and not knowing shit. But there is a producer that I would never deny the merits of, Bolo, right? He he um he produced undeniable viral hits like Silent Hill Watch Me. That's damn near an old town road. He made that beat. His comment was, I've heard plenty of stories about this, but I've always got my money on time. Maybe I'm lucky or my lawyer is good, but I hate to hear stories like that. I feel like that's the right way to say my experience is different, but I'm not denying your experience. I thought that was a really insightful way and a, and a template for people who want to weigh in on something that they might not necessarily agree on. However, I, again, I don't think people are leaving comments, disagreeing with people who have more experience in the business that, they want to get into because they have different experiences. I think they just want to hear themselves talk. And, and that's what, unfortunate. What what happens in, in a situation pain where you're just like, Hey, I'm, I'm not sending the stems over until we get a fully executed agreement. What, what, what is, what is there backlash for that? Or. It's just generally not done that way at, at a certain point you've done all the creative stuff and normally that's through the artist or the artist engineer, you know, someone reaches out and says, I, we need those stems or they say, we need those stems and then we'll send you the agreement, that kind of thing. And I, I certainly think you could say, well, I'm not going to send the stems until I get the agreement. Could there be a backlash? I don't know how real it would be. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to try depending on what your lawyer says. But another thing is, and this is something that people are probably going to deny, but I know this is happening. I've had it happen to me and I've spoken directly to other producers, sometimes publicly. Look at my Young Forever interview um, for whom this has happened. A lot of these songs that are dropping are two tracks. So they sometimes don't even ask for stems. Or worst case scenario, if they if they don't have the stems, they just drop it. Yeah. So yeah. So I guess I, I probably wouldn't go there. Just I probably wouldn't do that. If I was a producer, I probably wouldn't say that. I would. I, I probably wouldn't like 
hold on to the stems until an agreement was sent. But it seems like the only thing that can kind of protect against this potentially happening is one, you know, just having actual relationships with folks and, you know, just bettering the communication um, and, and then your lawyer. What else? What else? There's having a good lawyer that is, you know, pretty proactive and and not aggressive. Well, I know some are. Uh, I know Adam is pretty ag- aggressive. I was just thinking <laughs> because he he's the guy that says he will relentlessly file takedowns if his producers haven't gotten paid. And he says that that is effective. Now, Adam's it, a different kind of guy. I'm sure it is effective. But I wonder. I if wonder if he has a reputation like for future business, like are people not coming to some of his producers because of how aggressive he's been? And I'm not saying he's wrong at all. Like he's, it seems like he's always in the right, like legally, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming like there could be, I don't know, maybe they, maybe they, he has a, a wonderful reputation and people love working with him and on both sides. I, I mean, producers certainly do. Let me look up one of his producers. Uh, you know what? I think the short answer is no, probably not. I interviewed one of his producers and we've, we've had him on and he doesn't, didn't we ask him that question directly? I'd like to have him on again, but I think we asked him that question directly. And I think he just said, look, I'm the lawyer. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And the artists are still going to work with the producers if they want. And the labels have to just deal with it. And you know, that's kind of true. Like if you're a producer and you're working closely with an artist and it's time for their next album and you've worked close, like the, the label's not going to say, Oh, who made these beats? Was this so-and-so? Yeah, we can't, we can't do this. Now they're going to make the deadline and they're going to deal with it. And I, and I also, it, it, this is a funny conversation because it kind of shows you how much power we per- perceive the labels to have when we're afraid to get as aggressive as they are. Like I look at them not paying someone for nine months to a year as an act of aggression. That's shitty. You're taking money out of someone's pocket who might need that money to support their kid, to pay their rent, to um, sustain their business. But the second your lawyer says, okay, we we need a, a hard boundary here. Then it's like, okay, are we, are we, are we crossing a line? Like, no, we're just, we're, I guess, just matching legal energy, which in the context, I think is totally fine. It's not in like a friendship or a relationship or someone screaming in your face. You're like, oh, scream back in their face. That's different. But if a label's like, we're going to play games and hold your money for ransom, then it's like, cool, we hold the creative assets for ransom. I don't, I don't see a problem with that. But the fact that that gives us, a degree of fear just kind of shows you that there is some toxicity in this dynamic. Yeah. I'm, I can't think of anything else than to, you know, hopefully just have great communication and relationships with the people that you work with and just have, you know, a, a lawyer that's on, on top of things. But I definitely, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't do anything drastic or take anything public or anything like that. That would be like a last super last resort if ever um because i know that i know that creators have a tendency to go to social media yep things and we talked about this a lot on this podcast um, i've done that but that's probably not going to get the job done um and it's going to make you it's going to have some unintended consequences most likely um so please use that as a last resort yeah, sometimes, sometimes you know, like those long ass letters to the fans that we've seen artists write about how their labels are doing A, B, and C to them. Those artists seem to do all right, but I, it's probably different from well, a producer who's in an active negotiations, right? Yeah, well, I, that's always going to work because you know, no matter what, and we talked about this too. Like, I think a lot of the times those artists' letters are bullshit, and they're just trying to gain sympathy from their fans and it's never you never hear the labels side of whatever the situation is um you know so that to me is like because because artists are just 
hopping on to a, a story that's been told over years and years that people just automatically believe that the labels and managers are bad and they're the good. Um, well, people just think, lie. Yeah. A lot of people lie. It's ridiculous. Well, um, I mean, and that's the reason, again, I, I don't do business over the phone or via conversations. I mean, I do, but when it comes time to actually discussing the business is it's a text, it's an email, it's via uh, someone else, a manager, so, someone who is also on the same page as me because I've had, I can't tell you how many times I've had a recording artist reach out to me and be like, I bought a beat exclusively from you. Why are you still selling it? And I'll be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I bought a beat exclusively from you and it's still on your site. This is a major problem. And they're ready to just go off and cuss me out. And sometimes they do. And I'll say, well, show me the email or the text because I only do this kind of business via email or text. And it comes with paperwork. Show me the email or text where I sold you an exclusive beat. They'll show me the text. It'll be like me saying, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll cut the unlimited rights in half. So I'm like, you mean to tell me not only am I giving you a deal on this, but I also made it very clear what kind of license it was. And when I point that out to them, you know, the tone changes and everything's all good. But if I didn't have it in writing, if I just hopped on the phone with everybody, they could easily just hear what they wanted to hear or, you know, not everybody understands these terms. So it's always just good to have it in writing. Otherwise, it'd just be their word against mine. And then when something like that happens, you go to the internet. I mean, there was that guy that, <laughs> that <laughs> of course, you didn't see the video because it's stupid. But there was a guy who, who jumped in my DMs and was like, yeah, I appreciate what you're doing with, for the com producer community. I like that video. I just tuned into your YouTube live. So, like, the guy knew I was a producer. And then a year later, he sends me another follow-up DM saying, here's how to buy my beats. And I just replied, I don't want to buy your beats. And he went off and made a whole video talking about, I didn't know he was a producer, man. And it's like, people can lie all they want, but I have the DMs in writing. You can't escape from that. So, Well, I think a lot of people are using bots and bots and or just blindly copy and pasting. So instead of saying that, he opted to lie and say he didn't know you were a producer. Well, he said both. Actually, he said, I don't know who I send this stuff out to. I don't know what you do. I don't know who you are. I just send it. And it's like, well, that's a pretty stupid thing to say because that's terrible behavior. And that's an awful way to look at potential business relationships. But he also did lie and say I, that he didn't know who I was. And it's like, you seem to know a lot about me and we have a, a DM history. So all I'm saying is that People. But a lot of people, but in those, <laughs> but he, there's, it's very likely that he didn't know who you are, right? Because a lot of these spam copy no, he, paste he did. situations, he what? I mean, he certainly knew a lot about me in the well, video and then in like the pre conversation, but, hey. but a lot of people hit you up. And because instead of just the, the copy paste, will say like, Hey, Damien, I've been following your page for so long. Oh, it actually don't even say your name. It'll just say, hey, I've been following your page for so long. I enjoy the content. That's just a copy paste job. Oh, yeah. You know, so maybe it was one of those that, that you got. And it no, was no, no, no. This, this was this was an actual conversation because I had just done a YouTube live and, and it was a beat making thing. And he reached out. and was like, yeah, I appreciate that. I tuned in. I was in the live. We talked. I was like, yeah, cool. Appreciate that. And that was it. And then he talked about his beats and his production career. And yeah, it was, it, we established that we were both producers, but those sneaky, this, I, my, I made a whole video about the scams. They use the same language. And I'll tell you, Dame, I'm getting those scams for, I, I think, I don't understand why they're effective. Cause I feel like our bullshit detectors should be going off when we get something like that because it's always the same form. And it's like, Hey, blank. Maybe it's your name. Maybe it's some fill in word like fam or gang or whatever stupid shit people are saying nowadays in the DMS. But then it always comes with, I checked out your blank. And I really think it's amazing. It's it, they always lead with a compliment. 
and then it's i have this opportunity and then at the at the very end once they've buttered you up with the compliment and this promise of an opportunity it's it's the pitch which is i just need fifty dollars i just need a hundred dollars i just need two hundred dollars and people fall for it every damn time someone re- it continues to reach out some ukrainian producer i don't i don't know why these dudes like are creating a really bad reputation for eastern europe but he reached out and it was some stupid ass email talking about i I heard your songs i think they're bangers they're hits i i love your voice all just all this dumb shit i'm like who is this working on i hope it's not working on rappers but it's got to be working on somebody yeah i don't i mean I, if if i get a dm and it doesn't you know if it just starts out hey i don't know and i don't know you i typically just delete it i don't even i don't even read it and i don't and maybe that's working for maybe that's working for for people maybe i i don't know but um i definitely wouldn't encourage you know using bots or anything like that um you know to try to sell your services but um Anyway, let's just get to the other topic because I I posted <laughs> a little question for you, Payne. Like, how many how many friends do you have in the music? People that person that you would consider a friend. Like, how many friends do you have in the music industry? I guess solid six, maybe seven. Yeah. So I I mean, and I what I had to realize early in my career and i still fail to realize it sometimes it's like there's just different levels of friendship because you know the the people that i'm like friends with like that i consider like almost my family that's that's a different type of friendship than you know i was able to establish with very many people in the music industry and i took i took my definite friendship and i brought it to the music industry and realized right away that well not even right away i realized eventually that People didn't have that same, like people will use that word and not mean what I mean. So I was like, okay. So my wedding was last year and I probably had four people from the music industry. And and the wedding was, it was a decent sized wedding. It was probably close to 200 people there. Um, And that's not to say that I'm not super cool with people, but I definitely have relaxed, you know, kind of calling people friends or you just have different different levels of friends like because what i was expecting or how i was expecting people to operate wasn't how people were operating when they called me their friend in the music industry and i'll give you i'll give you an example of this like when the when the funk volume shit was going down like there was a platform at the time i don't even think it exists hard knock tv cat named nick ran it um and and me and nick were cool like maybe almost like we didn't really hang out and things like that but i thought i thought it was deeper than just like music industry stuff i i thought he, you know the energy was cool i we would hoop sometimes he would invite me to hoop uh things like that but when that shit was going down um you know he let hobson do an interview on hard knock tv he let hobson and he knew like his connection to hobson was through me like every time he wanted to hop on hard knock he would come to me and i you know i would make sure that it happened so i felt like there should be some type of loyalty to me right that's just how i felt about it this is just my side of the situation so so i was kind of hurt when he allowed hobson to go on the platform and like just completely shit on me without having a conversation with like what happened or allowing me on the platform to 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 share my story i thought that that was i thought that that was messed up and in my world of friendship that's 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 the messed up thing to do i don't know how you would i don't know how you would view that situation pain but that's how i viewed it matter of fact give me give me your opinion on on how you would view the person that allowed a person another person that's attacking you publicly on their platform to amplify their voice well number one i i am sorry i i didn't go to your wedding um yes pain pain was invited he was one i, of I was invited i was one of the, the does that put me in like the non-friends category now <laughs> no nah, it's all good you live okay. in Wisconsin. i i'm not tripping if people 
couldn't make it to my wedding. Not a big deal. But Payne, would you be upset? Would you be upset if somebody started beefing with you and I just allowed them on the Independent Living podcast to talk shit about you? Yes. And as a matter of fact, this is this is weird. I've been noticing this a lot. I where people will bash my my friends in front of me and expect me not to react. Someone recently tweeted me. It's about an artist that a rapper that I work with very closely. Very closely. You know, we've toured extensively together. And and you're one of the people too, Dame. Pe- and people try to come at you in my comments too all the time and it's like when I check them for that, they're like, oh, why are you dick riding Dame? Bitch, that's my friend. What the fuck kind of friend are you? So someone, that, this is what I don't understand, because you use the, the L word for loyalty. You know what I mean? Like, there are people who are totally fine, I guess, with this concept of someone bashing their friends. This, this Someone random tweeted me, you know, this rapper, I just realized this rapper sucks. He should be grateful for DJ Payne 1 giving him these beats. And I replied, I told him I smacked the shit out of him and I will. Um, but his reply was going on this whole rant about, I thought pain one was cool. Fuck pain one. You, you think you know somebody? No, you don't know me. You think an indie, indie artist is cool. No, I'm not cool. Not with that shit. I don't, I don't know why people think they can just disrespect and violate someone that you consider a friend in front of you as long as they're not saying anything about you. That's not how this works. But I do feel like there is this emerging. When I was growing up, I'm not saying this didn't happen. I'm not saying my generation was better than the current generation or that your generation was better than mine. It's just we didn't publicly admit to or celebrate disloyalty. And nowadays it feels like that's cool. Just let anyone say whatever they want. It's just talk. Like, no, it's not. It's disrespectful. You can't, you disrespect a friend of mine around me. You're disrespecting me. I don't understand why that's a strange concept. With my situation, like I, I talked to him afterwards and I'm like, bro, like if, 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 if the shoe was on the other foot, like I don't give a shit about the views or the clicks. Like I'm not allowing this particular conversation to happen on my platform. I'm not going, I'm not going to let somebody talk shit about someone that I respect and just amplify their disrespect on my platform. Like I'm going to be like, okay, you know, that's, that's not a, that's not a conversation for the independent living podcast. Right. And at the time, like I understood the brand of his platform. Like it it always appeared to be like, he always would get like conversations with some of the, the top artists. Right. So it wouldn't make sense for me to be on the platform. I get it. But just say, hey, like this isn't, you know, this isn't the conversation I want to have on this platform, you know, or at least reach out to me, have a conversation, something. But I think, you know, a lot of times people get into this space and they're so hungry to get views and try to get to the next. I bet you he thought, oh, this was really spicy. You know, I'm going to get a lot of views for this. I'm sure that's the mo. That's all he was thinking about. Mm hmm wasn't thinking about like how like what kind of space I was in at the time or how it might impact me because Hop was going on like a like a super press run like all the shit that I couldn't get him to do like during fuck volume like because you know for press runs he would sometimes miss interviews on purpose right yeah, he but did that, an interview with all the didn't he do like power 105 he did he everything. went he went everywhere so I was my name was getting dragged through the mud like crazy and you know homegrown radio that's why i respect them to this day that's dj head and and chuck dizzle you know they allowed hop on the platform but then they opened up the platform for me too to have you know to have a conversation so i i respected that and i even respected vlad at the time i was about to say didn't didn't goofy ass vlad even give you (laughs) yeah yeah um so i got an opportunity to and this is this is not what i wanted to do but like i did not like i wanted to keep everything in house like just i i'm not trying to be in the public like this especially in this light um but i felt like i had to at least you know on the platforms that would allow me like to tell tell my side of the story um you know so anyway just kind of you just have to be not th- not saying that you can't have friends in this industry cuz you can like there are a lot of good people I would just encourage you to to go through a much more thorough vetting process 
and just kind of adjust your expectations accordingly because a lot of people are out here, you know, just selfishly trying to get to the next level, whatever that means to them. Um, and, and they'll kind of do anything to do it. You know, I know shit when funk volume was, was doing well, I got a lot more phone calls than I got after the crash and burn, right? Like a lot more people wanted to speak to me, you know, while funk volume existed than when it didn't. The second something else positive happens, your phone starts ringing again by the same yeah. people that didn't call. I'm, I'm, I know. Like as soon as, as soon as you know, because I feel like Big Jaws on the brink of getting some really great opportunities, and I'm sure that as soon as that happens, yep. you know, it's going to be very easy to get a call back. People are going to be calling me, and, and I, and I get it. You know, don't get me wrong. Like some of these relationships are transactional, and if that's what it's going to be, like if it helps me and it helps you, then transact like it is what it is and they don't, they don't need to be no friendship or anything like that we exchange some value and keep it pushing for me friendship it means a lot to me like my friends mean a lot like loyalty like respect integrity all that stuff means a lot to me and just know that a lot of people aren't bringing that same energy to the table and you have to protect yourself at the end of the day yeah and i feel like if you don't know that already from regular life then maybe you just haven't lived long enough. I don't know. Uh, but, I, you know, I, we all go through this, I think. I certainly went through my share of friends, and some of them happened to also be in the music business, but they were my friends first, and stuff happened. and Or maybe I met them through the music business and we became friends, but our friendship dissolved not because of the music business. I don't think it's ever... You know, people say the music business will damage a friendship. No, people damage friendships. It has nothing to do with the nature of of the environment you're in. It's it's them making those decisions. Well, I do think that, you know, in the music industry, it's kind of like a what have you done for me lately? And there's like a there's a lot of there's a lot of people that might be borderline desperate. Sometimes people mask it a little bit more. Um, and I think I think you're right. I think obviously it, it happens outside of the music industry, but like when I was, when I, when I came into the music industry, I just started having a lot more interactions with people than I probably would have otherwise. Right. Um, so I, I think some people do mask it. I think there's a lot of desperation. Um, and I've seen a, a lot of people do some shady shit. If I was continued going down the consulting route, I don't think I would have seen as, as much shadiness like firsthand if I was still working at Deloitte or just kind of, you know, kept rising up the ranks in the corporate world. Don't get me wrong. Corporate world is the, can be the shadiest of shady places, but I don't think I would have seen, you know, I wouldn't have had as many weird interactions, um, you know, just climbing the corporate ladder as, as, as I do in entertainment. Well, if you don't look at it as a friendship, then it's a, different sort of feeling when things uh go go the wrong way and i think that's maybe the issue that a lot of people are eager to one weaponize friendship and to embrace friendship in these more transactional spaces so instead of just seeing a situation for what it is and saying you know what let's work together on th this music business stuff if a friendship develops, cool. But if it's just transactional, at least let's just respect each other within that space. And if someone makes a business decision, you know, if someone at the end of the day says, uh, you know, my my song doesn't make their album, the song that I produced, that's going to be different from someone that I'm friends with and then them not telling me until the album drops. You know, like this happened to me with... Um, with the games album, Jesus piece, my song is still on the album and I, what they haven't paid me some of, some of the events and I'm not going to get into that, but back to the Taz Taylor conversation. But when the el the physical album dropped and my song wasn't on it, it's not like I was going to call up the game and be like, man, I can't believe you would do this to me. This is, this has nothing to do with him and we're not friends, you know, but if it's someone that I work closely with, 
And then the day after the, the album is, is released, I start texting them like, why, why would, why didn't you just tell me I wasn't on the album? You know what I mean? That'd be, it'd be a very different conversation. Um, but I, I, that's why I just create a lot of distance between myself and the people that approach me in that way. Cause that my, 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 what's the, what's the term? my my alarm bells start going off when someone that i don't know is trying to work with me in the music business and they're framing it as a friendly thing not as a collaborative creative music business thing you know what i mean that's automatically ringing alarms in my head where i'm like either this person is just trying to work an angle and they think I'm a sucker or they just really don't know what they're doing and they're being socially inappropriate. Either of those scenarios is a, either is a red flag, but you got to protect yourself either way. You know, like when people are out in, in public and someone's acting way too friendly with you, you know, what are they trying to get out of you? That's unfortunately an impulse that we have. That's a reaction that we have. Yeah, there's a, I mean, I see that uh, there's a lot of people on social media that they don't really value. It's not really about the relationship that it's about like, like when they shout, like when they shout, like I'm, I'm very particular about even shout outs. Like, am I shouting this person out because I want other people to know that we have a connection? Well, don't do that. Just send them a text. Like just send them a text. Like, I, you know, I, that's not... I don't need to I don't need to prove publicly that I know this person and try to get some likes or follows off that. And and, you know, but I see a lot of I see a lot of that, like just over hyping, over exaggerating, like an achievement of somebody else. Like you don't really know them like that. You're just trying to <laughs> you're trying to bring you're trying to bring a spotlight to yourself. Um, OK, let me yeah. bring a spotlight to myself quick then to end this podcast. <laughs> So we did that whole episode on AI and I know we didn't agree on everything, Dame. I feel very vindicated right now. So I don't know if you've been paying attention to the AI space, specifically where it intersects with hip hop, but I've been seeing fake Kanye, fake Drake, fake Kendrick Lamar songs. And there are some producers who are making beats around these, these, these deep fake rap songs you know this is like this is what it would sound like if kendrick and cole did an album together and you know what it's cool to listen to and i think it's a genius of a producer to do this because it'll it'll bring them a lot of attention and it'll showcase their beats um but now there's apparently it could be fake i can see that this could be completely fake just like the uh there's this hilarious guy um what is his name? Why well, uh, then I won't say it, but but there's a hilarious guy who does deep fakes with like beat generating AI. And I, I'll I'll shout him out in a different video. But there's this app that makes your voice sound like Kendrick Lamar. I don't know if I believe it. I think it could just be a fake video, but I don't think the technology is far off. So you see this rapper who's using this this so-called Kendrick Lamar voice filter. And he sounds like Kendrick and he records a song in the Kendrick voice. And Young Guru went on a on a on Instagram and wrote this long post warning people that, you know, this could get really bad and that and for those who don't know who Young Guru is, it's Jay-Z's engineer. Shout out to him. Um, I actually interviewed him uh, a year or two ago. Pretty amazing, thorough interview. Um, but he was warning people that laws need to be passed to prevent this technology from, from being abused. The reason I feel vindicated, we could talk about the technology, but I feel that this is my time to, to be selfish. I feel vindicated because I said AI technology would affect rappers just as much, if not more than producers, and it would cause tremendous problems in the copyright world. And it looks like that's what's happening with this. Um, Meanwhile, I worked on a partnership recently with an <clears throat> AI tool called Lalal, L-A-L-A-L, which it, they've been around for a while. It's a STEM maker. 
and it's great for producers. I think it'll um, help producers more than hurt us. And I feel like that's where this technology is going, at least for the time being. And the reason I think that there are a lot of fatalistic people who are just there waiting and posting comments, talking about, hey, I going to replace all you producers. You're all going to be out of here. The reason I think that's not true is because the consumer appeal in a voice filter that makes you sound like Kendrick Lamar is way higher than the consumer appeal for an app that um, automatically generates a, a drum loop that sounds like Oz or Sunny Digital. Because most people are fans of rappers and there's more novelty in that, whereas the production side of things is less novel, more technical. So if you were going to invest your money in an AI technology, would you pick the one with the most consumer appeal or would you pick the one that's probably more complicated to create and has less of an of a existing audience i i think you just kind of answered the question pain yeah it's, 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 it's a like, rhetorical question <laughs> but i still i don't know how this pro i don't know how this proves that it's affecting just because you can mimic a voice like i i still wouldn't agree that it's going to affect artists more so than i mean uh artists just as much as producers it's helping producers now because the the technology right now I, I've seen no producers being replaced, but I've seen artists being, for lack of better a better term, exploited, misrepresented by the technology. And there's that potential for a Drake song to leak that's not actually a Drake song. And who and then, benefits and from what that? Happens. And then when Drake says it's not his song, like what... Well, I I just think that it we it's it, I'm not saying producers are getting replaced right now. All I'm saying is it's m more likely and going to be more prevalent for artists to eventually just hop on the internet, click a button, and then the beat comes out, and then they rap over it instead of going to a beat marketplace. And that's going to be more prevalent than 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 like AI generated artists. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that that couldn't happen, but what I'm saying right now is it's the opposite where producers are exploiting the AI technology to replace the rappers. In the but, who's sense doing, but who's doing that other like, okay, it one I, I saw a couple viral Eminem songs, but like who's doing this in mass to replace artists like it, no they're not i'm not saying artists will ever be replaced i'm saying it's affecting the artists in the sense that now they have to either respond to the fakes or like young guru was saying now there has to be some sort of legislation to account for a potential i'm thinking what if a, a you know a, a jay-z and kendrick lamar um collab album drops and it was just the work of some sneaky ass producer does that producer get sued? What like what happens? Is that a copyright infringement? What is that? So it's going to get messy and it's going to affect everybody for sure. But I mean, Jay-Z and Kendrick Lamar have platforms to immediately say like, hey, we have nothing to do with this. And I'm sure that at some point there has to be some kind of legal action that can be taken if somebody's impersonating you or replicating your voice um, through one of these AI, you know, tech tech to one of these AI platforms. Um, yeah, but is it so yeah, parody? I, I don't, I don't, I just don't, I just don't see how you feel vindicated, Payne. I don't, I, mean, I feel vindicated in the short term. Let me have my moment. My, my moment right now, <laughs> because I'm, I'm a producer and I've, I'm seeing comments every damn day saying producer about to be replaced, producer about, about to be replaced, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking around and I'm only seeing producers using this technology to their own advantage at this point. As they should. I think that yeah. I think the producers that don't are going to get left behind and they will get replaced. Like there needs to be some value add, um, you know, so. So, yeah, Well, it's like a lot of people make the assertion that if a producer doesn't get in front of a camera, they won't survive. And there are certain producers who have never gotten in front of a camera and they're doing just fine. But then the current of the culture goes in one direction, which is that producers also become influencers and personalities. And it's, it's much more an expectation now. So 
I, I, I think, and I don't, I don't, I don't think you're speaking in absolutes or thinking in absolutes, but I think there will always be exceptions and there will also always be spaces. I mean, there are still producers to this day. Now it's becoming a novelty to see a producer use like a SP because everyone's doing um, DAWs. So if you see someone with an SP and um, then, you know, new NPCs are coming out all the time and, and selling a lot. It's just, there's the current and then there are the people that swim upstream and there are enough in both directions to create spaces for pretty much any kind of thing. All right. Well, we can we can wrap this episode up, Payne. You got any more updates? Um, Oops. do I have updates? No, I'm not Aaron. Uh, <laughs> if Aaron were here, she'd have a lot of updates. Have well, happy out, uh, happy well, first episode of of um, Women's Month. There you go. Well, check out the the latest episode of the Independent Living Podcast with Queen Herbie and Nick Noonan. Um, if you're into comedy. Uh, we have a web series dropping soon, actually tomorrow, which is Thursday, but you guys will hear this Monday, uh, Big Jaws new series, Cuddle Season. Uh, the soundtrack is out. Uh, we'll be promoting that heavily over the next few few weeks. Um, so I think it's pretty dope. So we have some, who, who do we have on the soundtrack? We have Dylan Reese, Darius J, Keon Bell, uh, Saeed, Herb the Phenom, and I always, oh, Sean Carson. Um, so check it out if you like R&B and if you like comedy check out Cuddle Season dope once again appreciate you tuning in to the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast next episode will drop at the same time next week peace peace